All right, today we're going to learn about the colonial revolutions that occurred in the Americas. We have three daily objectives. Number one, explain mercantilism. Number two, explain why the 13 colonies declared independence and how they won. And number three, compare slavery in the Americas with slavery in the ancient world. All right, so we've talked about, about mercantilism a lot. What you need to know about mercantilism is you have a mother country like England and a colony like North Carolina, and the colony produces raw materials like timber, cotton, tobacco, sugar, rice, all of those kinds of things for the mother country, who in turn takes those raw materials and, sell those, and sells manufactured goods to the colony. So guns, alcohol, clothing, that kind of thing. And this all rests upon cheap labor, i.e. slavery. Slavery is the key component in mercantilism. So we talked about colonies in North America. We talked about how the Dutch were the first to colonize North America, but were quickly ousted by the English, and how the English and French fought over North America in the French and Indian War as part of the larger Seven Years' War. Um, we talked about how the natives largely got along with the French and the Dutch because they were not permanent settlers, but the English were different. They wanted to permanently settle, and this led to constant warfare between Native Americans and the English, and we've seen this map a couple of times um, that kind of outlines where European countries had different colonies in the Americas. All right, so by 1750, English citizens had been living in the American colonies for about 150 years, and these colonies had largely been allowed to govern themselves in a process known as salutary neglect. You'll learn more about that in American one. Um, the thing is, is that the English king, who at the time was King George III, had spent lots and lots of money protecting the English colonies in North America from the French and from the Native Americans um, during the French and Indian War. He wanted his money back. So he decided to enact a number of laws and taxes on the American colonies like the Navigation Act, like the Stamp Act, that you've probably learned about and will learn about and again in American one. Um, the problem is the 13 colonies and the people living in them had no say so over whether these taxes um, were imposed on them or not. They had no say so, they had no representation in the English Parliament, and this made them very, very upset. So we talked about John Locke. Um, John Locke believed in this idea of natural rights, life, liberty, and property being the three big ones, and that the purpose of government was to protect these three rights, and if a government fails to do so, people have a right to rebel, and then this was John Locke over on the right. So the ideals of the Enlightenment greatly influenced America's founding fathers like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. And the founding fathers of the United States argued for the protection of these natural rights in the Declaration of Independence. They saw the taxes as being unfairly imposed upon them as a uh, violation of their right to property, for example. Um, now, American independence the American Revolutionary War is ultimately successful because of French intervention and English overextension. So the French agreed to come and help the Americans out. This was actually under Louis XVI, if you remember. Um, and the English have just conquered too much. They have too much land, too many other places. And they do not have the money or manpower to keep the, the now United States as part of the British Empire. So the U.S. Constitution, written by James Madison, establishes a republic in the United States, and this is the first real republic since Rome. And as we've learned, the French copy this republic, uh, but ultimately that collapses with the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now we're going to talk about Haiti. Haiti is another colony in the New World. It's actually right here that originally belonged to France. Haiti was known as the jewel of the Caribbean because it was the most valuable piece of land in the entire Western Hemisphere. More valuable than the entire 13 colonies, more valuable than Brazil. It was the most valuable piece of real estate in the New World, and that is because Haiti has the perfect soil to grow sugar. People in Europe love sugar. Um, sugar is a, a relatively new crop for them. They had been getting it from Asia for a long time, but now they're able to grow it in the colonies in the New World because it's the right climate. And Haiti is the premier producer of sugar in the world at this point in history, and the Europeans just can't get enough of it. So Haiti, once again, is a French colony. Um, it's growing lots of sugar. It's make fr making France very, very rich. Now, Haiti is one of the very first places 
that actually got explored and colonized by Europeans. And what happens when Europeans explore and colonize a new place? They enslave and kill everything. So as they did, as they did just everywhere else, they also do in Haiti. They show up in Haiti, they enslave the natives, they make them grow sugarcane. All the natives die real quick. They don't treat them very nicely. Um, and what the Europeans start doing is because they don't have anyone to work, work the sugarcane plantations, they start bringing in African Africans as slaves. They start bringing in enslaved Africans to work the sugar plantations. Now, Haiti is a very, very hot place. It is very right here. Notice it is very close to the equator. There are lots and lots of diseases and lots and lots of insects. Because of this, there is a very high mortality rate among the enslaved African population of Haiti. What that means is they are dying in droves. It is literally cheaper for a Haitian slave, a French slave owner, to kill a sick slave and buy a new one than it is to pay for medicine for a sick slave. And that's what they're doing. So there's lots and lots and lots of African slaves in Haiti. In fact, 94% of the population of Haiti at this point is of African descent. 94% is, is enslaved Africans. Only 6% of the island is French. You can see, I hope you can see where we are going with this. The Africans are the vast majority of the population. They are being treated terribly. I hope you see where we're going for this, with this. So ultimately, the African population of the island rises up against the French and pushes them out of Haiti. They are united by this guy, General Toussaint Leverture, who is a super important person. He is like the founding father of Haiti. So Toussaint Leverture, uh, he brings the African population together. They push out the French, um, and they create their own country led by him. Now, the French come back multiple times because they want Haiti because it's the most valuable place in the New World. And the African population under Toussaint Leverture continues to beat back and push out the French every single time. They beat the most powerful country in the world every single time. These dudes are awesome. The problem is Haiti is a threat to pretty much everyone. So, in your head, I hope you're thinking, well, why don't they just, like, team up with the United States and trade with them? Because, like, they just got rid of the English and that they're working out great. Why can't, why can't Haiti and, and the United States get together and be friends? Because, like, they both have a shared history, right? They both just overthrew their colonial masters. The problem is the United States owns lots and lots of slaves. You see, the thing is, Haiti, to most of the world, isn't a great revolution that happened because slavery is awful and because we really should be looking at the Enlightenment ideals for everyone, not just white people. They're not seeing it that way. The way that most of the world is seeing the Haitian Revolution is as a slave rebellion. And because the entire world relies on mercantilism to get rich and mercantilism relies on slave labor, they see the Haitian Revolution as a threat to the way the world works at this point in history. So everybody refuses to trade with Haiti. They won't talk to Haiti. They won't trade with Haiti. They won't recognize Haiti as its own country. They just see it as a crazy, scary place they don't want to deal with. Because the only thing Haiti is really good at is, is, is growing sugarcane, and because the vast majority of that sugarcane up until this point is being traded to other places, and because now no one will trade with Haiti, Haiti becomes very, very, very poor very quickly. It goes from the richest place in the New World to the poorest place in the New World overnight because of the Haitian Revolution. Haiti remains poor to this day. Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere to this day because of its poor treatment by Europeans. Now let's take a couple minutes and talk about slavery in the New World because it is important. Slavery has pretty much always been around. It's still around. Not the way you think of, but it is still around. And again, it has always been around. But slavery in the New World is especially bad. And let's talk about why. Slavery in the New World, not just North America, but North and South America, number one is hereditary. So if you are a slave, your children are slaves. It didn't work like that in the Roman Empire. Generally, slaves got their freedom and their children were never slaves. It didn't work that way in Africa. Yeah, people might have been captured and forced to work um, for another tribe in Africa or for another kingdom in Africa, but it wasn't hereditary. Your children were not also slaves. Generally, your children were part of the tribe, just like you were eventually. 
Um, it is based on race. So who are the slaves in the New World? Black people are the slaves in the New World. It's not like that throughout most of history. In Rome, white people were slaves too. In Rome, people from France, from England, from Italy, from North Africa, from Asia, lots of people were slaves. It wasn't based on race. They didn't really have a conception of race by skin color as we do today. Um, so in the New World, if you're black, you're probably a slave unless you can prove otherwise. This is new. This is different. This is awful. Slaves are treated as animals. This guy over here, I don't know what he did. But ultimately, when we go to point number four, slaves have no rights, he may have done nothing. Maybe his slave owner was just in a bad mood, and he just destroyed this guy's back with a whip. Maybe for no reason. Probably for no reason. And regardless of the reason, this is not justified. Nothing justifies this. So slaves are treated as animals in the New World. They're treated very, very, very poorly. And again, they have no rights. If you want to murder your slave, you can murder your slave. It's your slave. That's how they see it in the New World at this point in history. This is not the way slavery worked prior to. Nowadays, we have like, um, like, like sex trafficking. That's what I'm talking about when, when we talk about slavery nowadays. And it is pretty bad. Don't get me wrong. Um, but slavery is not like this for most of human history. Generally, people have rights. You can't just kill a slave because they're a slave. Generally, people get their freedom and become part of the country they, they, that, that had formerly enslaved them. But that's not the way it worked in the New World. If you were black, you were probably a slave. If you were a slave, you had no rights, and your owners could treat you any way they liked. The worst part, other than the way these people were treated, is that while these people, like, the, like in the United States, are using the Enlightenment, these natural rights, life, liberty, and property, they're using these to justify their own revolution, and they're not seeing in their heads how this is clearly, clearly breaking those natural rights. Um, so they are indeed hypocrites. It's hard, it's hard to say they're not. And finally, let's talk about race, specifically in Latin America. So race in North America is pretty straightforward. you got black people who generally were slaves, unless proven otherwise. And then you have white people, and then there's a social hierarchy of whites, the rich, the poor, the middle class. In Latin America, it's very different, and it's actually based on race, – race is much more complicated. So at the bottom of your Latin America social hierarchy, you have Native Americans. These are indigenous, Aztec, Maya, Inca, etc. Right above Native Americans are your Africans, both free and enslaved peoples. Above Africans are what are called mulattoes, which is – which sometimes – some people consider this a bad word. I'm using it in historical context. I'm trying to teach you something, so please don't be offended. Um, but a mulatto at, at this point in history in Latin America is someone who is of both European and African descent. So maybe your dad's Spanish and your mom is an African slave. Mestizos are people of Native American and European descent. The vast majority of people who are Mexican or of Mexican descent are mestizos. They are both Spanish and Aztec, the vast majority. Above them are Creoles. Creoles are people who were born in America, but they are of 100% European descent. So their dad and their mom are both Spanish or Portuguese, but they were born in America. And then finally above the Creoles are the Peninsulares. Peninsulares are people who were born on the Iberian Peninsula. So they are, were born in Spain or Portugal, and they are Spanish or Portuguese. So in Latin America, the people with the most power are the Peninsulares, the people who were born on the Iberian Peninsula followed by the Creoles, followed by the Mestizos, followed by the Mulattoes, followed by Africans, followed by Native Americans. Generally, the more European ancestry hat you have, the more important you are, um, if that makes sense. It shouldn't make sense, but that's the way it worked. You can see this social hierarchy kind of, sort of, a lot still in Latin America. Most of the presidents of the Latin American countries to this day are very, very, very light-skinned, and it's because they're Creoles. Their families are 100% Spanish or Portuguese going back for hundreds of years, um, whereas the mass, vast majority of the populations of South America are either mulattoes or mestizos. They're a combination of either European and African, or African and Native, or European and Native. Take a few minutes, answer your three daily objectives.